Hello, my name is RJ Reed, Ronald Reed. What we're doing today is having a discussion around uh, the conflicts and, uh, and issues that are going on right now since uh, Black Lives Matter has uh, emerged and, and the awakening of the diversity of America. The people I have with me right now are artists of different ilk and have uh, created, have worked on, have an opinion on what has happened, if it's not influenced themselves, recognizing what's been going on uh, around them and people around them. So without much ado, what I would like to do is just start to just introduce my, my people here panel, let you know about their connection to Maine and, and what they're doing right now, how they influence their society and their community of people. Okay, so let me start over right here. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, hi, my name is Tori. Um, I go by Tori Lynn on social media. I work in racial equity and economic development and um, I'm a community advocate so that's a really big and important part of my work and part of my art and my connection to Maine is that I've grown up here my entire life. I grew up in Brunswick um, and like everyone, like lots of young people, I left for a couple years and I said I'm never coming back here. <laughs> and then, um, you know, my family is here, my friends are here and I found myself coming back into the state and now I live in Portland, um, which I really love. And so I, it's, it's allowed me to kind of fall back in love with Maine. And yeah, that's my, that's my connection and who I am. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, that's very similar to me, Tori. My name is Desiree Nicole Lester. And I am from, born and raised in Portland, but I moved away when I was 18, um, you know, with the mind that I will not be returning unless, <laughs> you know. Um, but my family still lives here. Mm -hmm. And um, after a few years of living in New York and studying and working there and, you know, really moving from a small city to a big city where mm -hmm. here I was, you know, easily known, very tall, black person, you know, it's easy for me to know everyone yeah, right. or for people to think they know me. And so, um, yeah, it's nice to be back in my hometown to represent and give people, you know, someone to look up to. So I really like to take on new projects or inaugural kind of like art projects. So, you know, most recently here, um, I've done some things with like Wayne Fleet School, uh, my high school alma mater. So I got to work with them. And mm -hmm. then... Um, Indigo Arts Alliance. I'm always kickstarting new projects like the Kneeling Man Art Photography Project with TT, you know, to see where it's come from one summer ago to now. So um, you, you'll see me around. <laughs> I'll be in Portland more. <laughs> so Excellent. lovely to be here with you all today. Hi, I'm Natasha Mayers. I live in Whitefield. I've been an activist artist for about 50 years. I started uh, after I came out of the Peace Corps. I I worked at the state prison. I was the first woman they hired. I taught art. And then I worked in the, the county jails. And then I started the first bail project in the state and bailed people out. And ever since then, I've been involved with Nicaragua and El Salvador, uh, with injustice everywhere. Um, I use uh, many forms of art. Um, including my own paintings, but I work with my community to create p parades. I, I've supervised about 400 murals around the state where I get, I, I um, facilitate the mural painting, often about the history of a town done by the school and the community. Um, I taught at Amhi for umpteen years, and I've worked with uh, adults with mental illness for 40 years. And I have a lot more things to say, <laughs> but um, on to the next person. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sarah. Um, I go by Sarah. And um, <laughs> I am mostly an academic, uh, a real political wonk, um, more recently otherwise known as a political operative. Uh, I have worked in Maine politics for quite a few years. Um, moved here in 2013. My connection to Maine was that I moved here in 2013. Um, I grew up uh, a very transient life. I had family in the military, so that just meant wherever you were was home. <laughs> and I treated that way, so I moved to Maine um, and made some assumptions about it being my home. Maine taught me otherwise. 
Uh, <laughs> as it does. As it does, right? <laughs> so I currently live in Eastport, and how I contribute to art is I have been a performance artist. I escape from a bright pink straight jacket on a pretty um, semi-regular basis now as we exist in our ways to produce art um, in this past 18 months. But uh, yeah, that's how I contribute. I, uh, I do very, very obvious political statement art. <laughs> <laughs> oh, excellent. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and just a little bit, because I haven't just, just told you who I am. So I've been in Maine. I'm from London, England, so that's originally where my accent is. I forget sometimes, but <laughs> no one else does. <laughs> I've lived in Maine about 20 years, and uh, I work now as a psychotherapist. I've got my own practice now, um, and uh, really want to work with people of color, as they generally don't feel comfortable coming into psychotherapy. So I want to make that open to anybody that wants to come in and ask for help. So, uh, yeah, Bangor, Belfast, Orono. So I've lived in lots of areas there and graduated up in, in uh, Orono, UMO as well. Um, I just wanted to mention, recognize the diversity here, but yet the sense of people have been born and raised here. And so uh, right here on this panel, there is a diversity of Maine, right? And I, I just want to highlight that because it, it's, it's a rarity. And, I, and when I first came here, I maybe saw three people of color, right? Do you know? And, and, and I was in, Port in the Portland area, right? And recognizing that there is lineage here, there is history here mm -hmm. for, for African-Americans and people of color that have been here since birth. So I just... Just wanted to start with that, that piece there. Um, so just to center us, our topic of conversation is around art and artists, their role in resolving social conflict. Uh, how you use your talents to be able to find commune, to find uh, uh, a union up amongst many different cultural, many different uh, people. So just to start off with, I wanted to ask this question, um, and we're all artists in our own way, but I wanted to kind of ask this question first, um, and ask you first. Right? Sure. Yeah. Um, in art, what, what do you think the role of the artist is in society? Okay. Yeah, big one. Uh, big question, <laughs> we're starting off with first. Um, I mean, it's interesting because I think there's a lot of different layers of an artist. And mm. when I thought about this panel and was invited to speak on this panel, my first personal thought was that I'm not an artist. I felt like I needed to be, you know, painting beautiful, beautiful art or kind of making sculptures. And then I was thinking about it and a conversation earlier with TT really helped too of the fact that I do a lot of community work and a lot of community advocating and that's me being an artist in my own right, um, which I never thought of like that before. But I think the role of the artist is to really inspire and to motivate and to make sure that we are kind of forging this path forward, which is really how it relates to conversations of social and racial justice, of just continuing to move forward, continuing to kind of lead the troops yeah. and really paving a path for other people to come after you. And so when I think about the advocacy work that I do and really trying to advocate for black people, indigenous people, people of color, I think of that work of just going forward and making sure that I am paving paths so that people can walk down them easier than yeah. I ever have. So, yeah. yeah, it's interesting to say like, okay, I guess I'm an artist too, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A band yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, and thinking about, you know, we're coming into a space now where it's like presidents and CEOs will be obsolete like kings and queens. So what's your title gonna be, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> and that's what you get to ask yourself <laughs> right now. And that's a beautiful question, a beautiful place to be in, to feel like the work that you do is art. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. just acknowledging that. <laughs> um, Thank you. You know, and for me, I mean, what's been sitting with me is, you know, what's the role of art in a, in a space where, you know, it's pandemic crazy and yeah. um, this month is, you know, someone's birthday that I love, James Baldwin. And he, he really speaks on the role of art as capturing a piece of pain, you know, and how 
you can use um, trauma or places where you're stuck to like transmute that pain or um, you know begin to share your story so that it might make the way a little bit easier for someone else and so I, I think that archive of you know maybe uh, something that like a first archive I remember reading of writers when I was a kid was like chicken soup for the somebody's soul you know right, right. <laughs> I was like yeah my heart needs that, that chicken soup and then, <laughs> You know, like, what's the what's the soup today? Like, we're asking today, like, now we're asking, what's the tea? Mm -hmm. You know, what's that? What's that? <laughs> what is it? Um, so I think that's really, that's where I see every human as an artist. You know, you have your story that is linked to, you know, we all have the things that we go through. And if you can take that and share it in a way, mm. you know, that's, that's what, that's what we're getting into yeah, right now. Yeah. So, um, yeah. No, that's beautiful. I, I, just to link there, I, it's interesting because as a, as a therapist for myself, what I find is that same kind of um, connection, sort of crossing over. So I'm a helper. So a helper is universal. If you're a mm -hmm. helper, you're a helper. Mm -hmm. right? and, and it could come from anywhere if you're willing to be open to accept it in. Right? And so my art is to join with people, figure who you are, and help you move along, whatever that might be. Yeah. And, and recognize there's many diverse people that can help you. The helper. Right? I'm also a helper. I know what language you're speaking right now, Mr. Psychologist, Enneagram. Like, okay. So I'm a preserving helper. Uh, I, you know, so I'm all about the preserve. <laughs> And, uh, but I love like being able to have this language of, you know, <laughs> but um, when you're speaking on help, one thing as a helper, I always think I know what's best too, when you're offering help. Mm -hmm. So you also have to remember to ask what people need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's my helping mm -hmm. practice right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I like it, yeah. Thoughts yourselves? It was a good conversation. Well, I really like the sort of like asking um, beforehand. Uh, one of my friends in um, undergraduate said something like um, very similar. Like you really need to like be in the place with the people who are needing the helping and hear what help they need. Mm. And he said, you know, one of the best lessons he gave me was stop doing the Care Bear. Uh, which was, you know, non-consensual helping, like, oh, I'm just going to use all my power to help you. <laughs> That's literally... <laughs> You're right? So um, I've taken that lesson really internally. I am grounded in, like, I am a wonk, so I love data. I love data in the aggregate. I like big data. So individual conversations are not something I usually delve into in a helping conversations. Mm. For me, it's like, how is this going to be seen from a group? Mm. How is it impacting a group? How does mm. it impact, how does working with an individual mm. even um, filter through the aggregate? Mm. So, you know, my art, I escape from a straitjacket, so my <laughs> art tends to be like a little nerve wracking for people. And I want to sit with them in that discomfort and I want them to experience it. And then I want them to have a conversation. I want that experience to stick with them. So it's not just theirs, like it's a community experience. Like I saw this woman, <laughs> she did a thing that really like, whoa, right. made me think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, um, you have an example of that. Cause that's provocative it sounds. You, you challenge people. No. <laughs> I do. Um, I do have a good example of that. Um, the first time I performed in Portland was at the Mayo Street Arts Center. Mm -hmm. um, and this wasn't a straitjacket escape. I did the classic burlesque balloons Ooh, okay. where you pop them. Oh, right. Right? So most people think that something's going to happen that's tintillating and exciting and glamorous. <laughs> I filled the blo balloons with blood. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and slowly popped them and made the crowd cheer for me um, in order to see more. <laughs> and then in the middle of the performance, I collapsed I, on the floor uh, <laughs> and didn't get up. And the curtain closed on me. And I could hear from the audience a woman saying, I thought I was going to be entertained. I was not. I felt uncomfortable. And then I understood. And that was the best feedback I've ever gotten. <laughs> Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. I feel uncomfortable. I love it. <laughs> <laughs>
I was like, that looks sounds intense, and I really want to go. <laughs> I, I like to challenge people in my town every year in the Fourth of July parade, and so uh, every year it's another issue that's very relevant and in the news. Uh, and some examples are um, like the global warming. We ha we we take two two sides of an issue. So we, we had the people who were advocating for global warming, like tropical fruit sellers and alligator hunters and the dermatologist and the air conditioner salesman. <laughs> and then we had the people who were opposed to, you know, or worried about global warming, like the, the snowplow uh, driver and the cross-country skier, and there was a glacier that was melting. And so very humorously, we, we get people to... Um, uh, you know, pay attention to learn some something to ask questions. Uh, we find that humor really disarms people, and mm -hmm. humor actually it's harder to dismiss something funny than something that's very horrible mm -hmm. um, and f and full of horror. Um, so a another example of that would be like the we pr we uh, we did something about the Green New Deal, and, and people don't really know about the Green New Deal, and a lot of people would be against it. So we instead we did the Green Nude Deal, <laughs> and we had all these painted nudes people were, you know, wearing, and, and we had a lot of card sharks passing out playing cards, um, you know, dealing the cards out with information about what the Green New Deal is. So, mm -hmm. so our role was to entertain and educate in, in a situation like that. And every single year we take another issue, whether it's immigration or drones, mm -hmm. surveillance, mm -hmm. um, um, and so well, on. I love that intersection, entertain and educate. Right. I think this is, you know, really... An, an important intersection because you know that's people are constantly wanting like what's that next mm -hmm. what's that they want to constantly be entertained yeah. but when you combine that with education that's real and tangible for them or part of their community then you know things start to get a little bit exciting <laughs> people pay <laughs> or, attention yeah yeah, yeah. So I like and that's the role i think of artists is to get people to pay attention yeah. mm -hmm. you know it's it's to yeah. uh you know, artist activists and community activists are truth tellers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we ref reflect, we respond to the times, and, and that's what we want to, to bring to people. I, I do it through my art. Yeah. Do you, let me ask you a question. Uh, you know, being a, you know, say it's not seasoned artist that's <laughs> been here for some time, so you've seen change. So I've seen 20 years and noticed the change in people's, people's attitudes, people's awareness with the art that you're showing. Do you see a change? Do you see a improvement, dare I say? Well, I, I love the last few years of, mm. of people connecting the dots. And so the issues are more connected. People recognize the connections. There's more allies right. forming between different groups to, to approach different issues. Right. Yeah. So, so like, like next um, in a, next month, the environmental community is working with the Wabanaki Nation right. um, on issues on in Indigenous Peoples Day. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. So exactly. So you you're it's a you're a brilliant kind of um, capsule of noticing what has what is happening and what's going on in the state of Maine, um, and and particularly around diversity and people and acceptance and then learning as well. So, so just to lead on from what you were saying there, the role of art um, as an educator, as a, an, uh, an, an awakener. In the last two years, do you think the artist, the creation of people like us um, has really tapped into that? Um, as an example, uh, I talk always about um, oppression because I have people that come to me as a therapist and they talk about different forms of oppression. My oppression is about being a black man in America, mm -hmm. right? And what that means and how I navigate through, through the world. So it's a silent thing until you get to talk about it. And I recognize the connection with other people's oppression. 
is oppression is oppression is oppression, right? Mm -hmm. That's the universality. I, I've got a great example of the, of the change. Uh, it used to be that when you went to a rally, uh, almost on any issue, progressive issue, uh, people would not make signs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when Trump got in, <laughs> everybody wanted to make their own sign. Mm. You know, they didn't even want to carry our beautiful banners anymore. They wanted to make their own <laughs> statement. Right, <laughs> right, yeah, that's a mm. good, yeah. See, that's a, a change right now. In art, that's art, that's, that's their own expression too, of it saying, I'm, I have something I want to say, and I'm going to put it on a sign, and I'm going to hold it up yeah. so everyone can see it in my own way of kind of expressing my viewpoints, which I think is great, because, yeah, I spent, like many of us, I'm sure we were all at protests a lot in mm. Portland yeah. last mm. summer. Every week, I feel like we were having protests, mm. um, and rightfully so. And a lot of people, that was their way of expressing themselves, I think, in ways that they haven't ever done before, yeah. which is in their own right, was, was art as well. So Yeah, it's yeah. an awakening, wasn't it? Well, oh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm thinking of it from the lens of, like, my first art experiences here in Maine was, you know, at what's now one Longfellow Square is, mm. you know, was the Center for Cultural Exchange. Mm. And there is a woman, her name's Toni Blackman. She came up from New York and she had an artist residency here. Mm. And so there's this history of Portland that has been hidden, especially the black history and right. indigenous history. Right. And so now there's really no hiding. Mm. So, you know, now you can really you can really see, you know, artist residencies and you can see a lot more artists of color coming to Portland right. to visit or, you know, hosting space or conversations like this. Mm -hmm. So now, I, I mean, that's the thing that I'm seeing like in the in the past couple, like two years then yeah. that I think is the most exciting. But also knowing that there are certain spaces that have vanished or disappeared, mm -hmm. that stories need to be told by these artists that have visited in the past so that they can make it come to life again. Right, yes. You know, so yeah. that's, you know, that's that's the my own research that I'm starting <laughs> yeah. to do, yeah. you know. I like yeah. I'm getting into the space where, you know, we've all had time to be with ourselves so I'm like ah, I can really work for myself I should work for myself I should never work for anyone again okay I'm getting into it <laughs> so that's where I, you know but yeah but I'm also like you know I've got these great stories so I'm figuring out how to put them together mm -hmm. right yeah oh yeah uh, the sto I just want to stay with this one the, so here's that lineage of of um people of color I'm just gonna I'm gonna really name it within America, within Maine more so, mm -hmm. that have this kind of uh, journey that they've, you know, through art, through their own history. Um, I've noticed as well, so I've just started, just to put it out there, I just, just started working at, at uh, Colby, just not a name plug, but, but the beautiful thing is, is that there's people from all over the country that are staff, that are people of color, that are coming in. Yes. Right. And, and I, know it's, I know, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, I'm going to say this is probably one of the first years, and I was part of that, you know, crew, that they did that, right? And you can notice, it's like a line, it's like an immigration line, right? Mm -hmm. People coming in. So I think it's, it's uncomfortable, people are not quite sure, right? Yes. Mm. This is a big, uh, 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 something I want to talk more about. Absolutely. Because, you know, especially for you saying that you've been in that, in that space, in that line. Mm. And what Tori was saying earlier about like, I'm not really an artist, but this is what I do. So like this idea of recreating. Mm. So in certain institutions, I feel like now they want to leave black and brown people holding the bag, if you know <laughs> what I mean. And I, <laughs> for one, <laughs> am the first to be like, <laughs> no. Right, right. <laughs> but you know, I also don't want to be so pessimistic. Mm. So if it, it, there, there's, yeah. There's two, there's a, yes, a big internal, like, conflict. It's like, am I going to be able to, are you going to be able to redefine the space, or mm. redefine the rules, mm -hmm. or are you going to be stuck holding the bag? Right, right, That's right. what I want to know. Yeah. And what kind of bag is it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a, yeah. Good. I, well, um, I kind of know what the bag yes. is because I'm a white lady. <laughs> yes. okay. Go ahead. So I'm just going to say, 
<laughs> right now, it's not she's a good like, idea. She's like, I got the stuff. She's, <laughs> okay, she's here to back us up. I am here to back you up. So Please what, back it up. <laughs> when we're talking about change and educating, what I have found um, as a person who passes as young, looks friendly, <laughs> and is white, <laughs> that a lot of people do not expect to be confronted with things they need to change. Mm -hmm. um, they expect me to be sort of an ally in their whiteness. And that's wrong. <laughs> that's a very wrong expectation. Um, and one of the things I've really noticed in Maine is a lot of people rely on their adjacency to blackness uh, to give them the credibility that they are not racist. Mm -hmm. While they are doing things that are very much influenced by white supremacy, but oh. not examined. <laughs> So, Brilliant, yeah. as a person in those spaces, some people have experienced my questioning that very thoroughly. And I think that's where the real change is, mm. is that people are still very surprised by me doing this work. Mm. But a few weeks or months later, they're like, oh, yeah, that was the whole point right. of, like, the 2016 Black Lives Movement. Mm -hmm. And then... Oh yeah, the George Floyd, we were supposed to be doing work on ourselves. Right. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. The whole universe aligned with you <laughs> to get it R done, R people. <laughs> yeah, brilliant, yeah. And, and, and that's the awakening, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I don't, and I'm, and here's, here's my diversity. So I was born and raised in London, England, not in America, right? Mm -hmm. so, so my experience of race and identity is different compared to African Americans. And I will say that. And, and, and in some aspects, it's an advantage for me, right? Mm -hmm. And in some aspects, it's not. Uh, 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 my, my, the way that I speak, right, alone, alone disarms people and they think that I'm something else, mm -hmm. right, than, than who I am. Mm -hmm. uh, on the phone, all those types of those things. So it's, it's very interesting um, um, that you make that statement. One, because what I see is, you know, in a sense, you know, if you are a person that has been oppressed, then you know what that is. You are already walking the journey. And, and it's those, and not to say that, everybody's not oppressed, I'm not saying it's that, but that we're talking particularly about the color of your skin or even the gender that you are, that is uh, the thing that holds you back because of society's ignorance, right? Mm -hmm. Naivety. Um, and, and then making themselves, that's the ego, making themselves feel good because they can brush up against yeah. somebody that yeah. identifies with what is cool right now, yes. right? Yeah. yeah. That's the thing. That's the kind of thing you got to break, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I don't know if it's just break. It's a deep pain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's like you know that that requires some integrity mm -hmm. to identify and give voice to. Right, right. And so that is what a lot of people, you know, they'd rather anger, anger and armor up right. and rush around mm -hmm. and feel the pain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. It's yeah. a choice, yeah. I think. Yeah. To acknowledge who you are and where you come from. Mm. <laughs> right, in that way. Yes, it's my, it's my favorite. I mean, I love it when you know, people here tell me to go back to where I came from now. <laughs> I really do. I love it. I'm just like, I'm like, where are you from? Where are your people? I, th I suggest you get in touch with your ancestors. <laughs> I'm like, oh, <laughs> where are you from? Okay. 200 years is not that long. Right, or right. 200 years is not that long. Yeah. Don't call yourself a native. And 20 years is not that long right. because I come from a white family. And they would not call themselves racist, but I have called them out as racists. Mm -hmm. So, like, I see their behaviors and I see their white supremacy, and they're one generation away from right. me. Yeah. Right. So, exactly. I, 200 years, 400 years, no. My dad is a problem. <laughs> right. 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 I cannot call him. <laughs> like, so I do have to do that work even there. And I'm not even going to place it that far away from myself. Mm -hmm. I still have to do work on me. Mm -hmm. And I have to hear that work from people who are giving 
a lot of their pain to me to say to me, you know what, Sarah? You need to think about that. Mm -hmm. you, you got a problem right now. And I have to interpret that as caring enough from, from that person to not let me walk through life ignorant mm -hmm. and hurtful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. walking through that pain is pretty important. Right. Yeah. There's something to be said just about generations, right? Because you, you, you are, it's like, you know, one step away. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm going to start at this point. So going back, thinking about Mainers, right? And, and what they know, their homogeneousness of what they see, and then what is touted to them, mm -hmm. right? And so if they don't have any challenge to that. So do you see the difference, not just your generation and your particular family, but that, that age group. So that's like my age group, right? So, <laughs> you know, that age group of that unaware of what is, who, what is America and what is going on here, right? Or right. what has, has been going on here. I don't know, what, you know. Are you asking me? Yes, absolutely, asking? yes. Um, well, I'm surrounded by a family all the young nieces and nephews are, have been arrested. Have my, even my 80 something year old stepmother was arrested. You know, like we're, we're, we're kind of competing with each other who can be out there on the s streets and take risks on, on all kinds of issues. <laughs> and there's several people of color in my family. Um, so we're pretty aware, you know, we get together and there's a lot of discussion that goes on and a lot of egging each other on to, you know, being out there and, and getting more informed and, and, and more active. Right. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that, you know, outside of your family, do you, what do you see, especially not living in Portland? Because <laughs> these are the people, you know, the mm -hmm. people that you're talking to, right? Well, I live in, in rural Maine, and half the people voted for Trump. Yeah. The other half are quite progressive. <laughs> so, you know, they butt up against each other, especially during those parades. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. it's very interesting. There, a lot of people will come, and they'll hate what I do and mm -hmm. what we're doing as a group, but they always want to come to see what we're going to do. Right. <laughs> And oh, there's man. the art. And, yeah. <laughs> oh goodness. <laughs> yeah. But that but there's the art, isn't it? It's mm. you know, it's about waking people up and and making them pay attention. And mm -hmm. at the moment, what I find that you know, less my that age group is that it's it's conflict. It's 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 people picking sides and, yeah. and fighting and and especially, I'm just going to be, again, a therapist. As you get older, it's harder to shift right? your, your ideology. You get more kind of rooted in your identity and the identity of your society. So it's hard to change because you've lived this way for a long time and it's comfortable. So I have a really good example of, of how I learned. Mm. Um, after we started bombing in Afghanistan, I stood with women in black on the street corner in Augusta in front of the library, and we all held signs with words about it, you know, to pay attention and do something and, you know, get out of Afghanistan and stop making war and all that. And, you know, we got the finger, we, yeah. p people didn't want to pay attention or anything. After that first year, and it was, we went every week, I painted enough sign, enough paintings for each person in the group to hold with no words, with images about war, with images about the, the trade towers being struck, with all kinds of mothers and children, no words at all. And people came to us. It was a wonderful experience to know to to to, to know that word that images speak way louder than words. Yes. Words divide us. Mm -hmm. Images can bring people together. Wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very true. Wow! Yeah, the, the the universality of 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 art again, and the image, and we suddenly forget our lines. And when we see a grieving mother or a child, we, if we have compassion, mm -hmm. you're going to react to that, right? Mm -hmm. that's, it. That's, that's brilliant. I, I really do think so. Uh, again, generational, right? I want to hold on to this because, again, as a clinician, what I find is if I'm the younger, 
that I, people that I speak to, the more universal, uh, the more diverse they are in their opinions and their understanding of themselves and of others on a, a whole array of subjects. And they're really aware of these last two years with the, the uh, Black Lives Matter and an awareness of, of culture and race in America. I'm, I'm, I want to just hand that kind of over and is it, do you see the same thing, you know, or in other generations, low, as they get younger, yeah? Um, and yeah, in your generation. I think, I think <laughs> <laughs> I'm phasing out of it a little bit, but yeah, I think it's still mine, I think, for now. I think it's still my generation. Um, yeah, it's, and I think part of it too is a level of safety because I, I almost feel like a lot of the people that are seasoned that I interact with that are very anti any type of progression and are very, very like against just anything that I'm advocating for in terms of inclusivity. Mm. I always want to be like, you were like me. Don't act like you were like me <laughs> 25 years ago. But then something happened where you get older and yeah. you get more comfortable and you got, start to get more, I think, terrified yeah. of change. Yes. When you're younger, it's like you're going, I mean, like even when we were kids, like we weren't scared of anything. We were just right. like jumping off of whatever and like riding our bikes and going rollerblading. Mm -hmm. And then you get older and you start to realize, I think just like these levels of just possible pain. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want to dive into the deep end of the pool anymore. And you don't want to kind of take risks anymore. You just want to do the status quo. Because I think a lot of that too, for people that are very like, I'm not doing that. I'm stuck in my ways. I'm always like, you were me. I know you were. Like, right. don't act like there wasn't <laughs> an issue that you were passionate about, that you were out there yeah. making your voice heard and advocating. And so I really try and just get people to tap back into that and like, yes, it's scary. There's a level of fear that is happening with, you know, just the world that we're existing in, especially when we're talking about race and racial equity. Mm. But I'm always like, what else are we going to do? Right. Are we just going to sit home and watch TV? Or are we going <laughs> to try and get out there and like make some changes? Right. And so it is generational. And I also think there's a level of fear that comes with, mm. as you get older, not wanting to make waves and just kind of wanting to yeah. keep it easy. So. Yeah. I would, yeah, I would agree in the sense that um, you have more, don't you? Oh, I don't want to lose my house. I don't want to lose this. Oh, my oh, job. Oh, my job. Uh, yeah, oh, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's the fear, right? Yeah. And so you don't want change, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, in that sense. Yeah. You know, one, one thing I think that's happened in, the, in this last uh, four years <laughs> uh, is that young people and older people uh, because there's so many issues, fires to put out, you know, just coming every day at us that we're more willing to collaborate and work as in groups. Mm. And the collaborative art process has been uh, probably the the best thing that I do that I've soup that I've I've made happen. I create community that way. Mm. I've I created this group called Artist Rapid Response Team, and we've made more than 400 banners for all the progressive groups in the state, more than 100 different groups we've made banners for. And, and, and to come together as artists to create something anonymously, we don't sign our names, right. you know, we are each putting ideas into it. We're all, uh, we're sharing all our technical skills and, and all of the ideas to, to create a, a, a group mm -hmm. image. Intergenerational learning, right. um, you know, I think because for me, I can't just say, well, I think that, you know, what I'm seeing is older people do this and younger. I find it that it's all mixed up for me. Mm. I, f I feel old. I feel like I mother my mother now. <laughs> <laughs> I feel older than my mother. Right. My mother feels, you know, it's like everything feels strange to me. My baby niece seems like a teacher to me. Right, right. Um, so I don't, I'm moving beyond the binary and mm. linear conversation where it's this or that yeah. or, you know, so I, I'm, I'm trying to get into what I'm, uh, what I'm seeing is, that's what I'm seeing shift because when you have intergenerational learning, things, yeah. you know, they become a bit blurred, yeah. which is what I'm looking for. You know, moving beyond, uh, I think that's why a lot of institutions, especially um, when it's around education, mm -hmm. are struggling because 
there was a moment where every educator had to say, I need these students to teach me how to use this technology so we can have a classroom together. <laughs> right. So, you know, that there was no escaping that. Mm. And I think that there was there was no acknowledgement of what we were all experiencing and like that lack of mm. acknowledgement is what I'm I'm really seeing like as a as this space that that's starting to change like if someone appreciates something in their life they're doing it more than ever and people who want to be nasty and stuck in their ways are nastier and more stuck in their ways mm. than ever mm. so you know for me I, i'm you know i'm trying to navigate my way yeah. kind of like you know how do i start to find the story you know that where do I find the story that activates the 25 year old and someone who's 85? You know, mm -hmm. I got to find that story and give it to them or remind them of what it was that they used to like to smell or wear that's mm -hmm. going to make them feel like they're 25 again yeah. and be out there, yeah. you know? Oh, oh yeah. I, I was just, wow. it's, I know, yeah, it's, it's this, uh, firstly, just to speak to what you're saying is, is it's, it's, it's about being open to progression right to growth and and sometimes it's you and sometimes it's me but i want you to grow just as much as i want to grow right and and not having walls or preconceived ideas of who would learn and who wouldn't you know or categorized in that way mm -hmm. um I think, yeah, I think that's really, I think that's, that's really. The, that's James Baldwin for me. He's my inspiration on that, you know, because he, it's like you can't hate the thing, right. you know, that has caused you the pain. Yeah. You yeah. gotta, yeah, you gotta find joy it. in that too. Yeah, and embrace that. <laughs> it I, hits the Gen X or really <laughs> <laughs> And I suppose a li just a, a little bit back to education and mm. academia. Um, <laughs> And what, you know, in that sense, what do you see? I, I, I know what I see, but what do you see in the sense of um, uh, a progressiveness? And, I, and, I, and it's like from professors down to the students, all of those. What movement do you see? What I see is what has been described. There's this bag and somebody's going to be holding it. <laughs> um, the students that are coming in, the ones that... Um, you know, the group of students that are okay, you know, the kids that are okay, mm -hmm. they, 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 they feel it and they embody that there is change happening and they're investing in a future that is uh, better. Right. Chefs kiss better. Um, but also those people who are stuck in their ways or comfortable or pain avoidant, mm. raised comfortable pain avoidant, kids. <laughs> so it's really important to have these people come together and do work together. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm seeing a trend in faculty where there are a lot of uh, a lot more diversity, a lot more diversity recruitment, but um, people who are hired into those positions move, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. they become like the diversity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm and they become the resource fight for diversity. So they are working with students, especially in um, the whitest state in America, <laughs> <laughs> that are also very young and coming to a space where they are also the diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, and they become, like the faculty becomes caretakers and they are not, that is not in the contract mm. that they signed <laughs> to teach, right? right? And you must know this as well because you've just come to in, into this Colby situation. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, so. It, but at the same time, again, I am a caregiver, so mm -hmm. at the same time, yeah. I want to support so, my yeah, people. Yeah, that's his job on camp, so that's right. great. Right. Right. I want to. <laughs> so so I, put out, I put out extra in the sense of that, and I will call it that humanness, mm. right? Um, um, my experience is, is, and I've only done one year, so I just want to highlight that coming there. But it's it's an interesting influx of, of diversity coming in, mm -hmm. and I, I I keep coming back to this. It's like this line. It's like my dad when he came to England. He was like, mm -hmm. you know, first generation from Jamaica, and it was this line, wasn't it? You know, you know, them over there, these people coming over, right? Mm -hmm. And it was almost like they were standing on each other's sides, right? Mm -hmm. And when he tells these stories, I was like. I think it's tough, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you're also making history. So right. right. Let's acknowledge that. Uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And and staying power because mm -hmm. it's 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 about 
um, another person of color seeing somebody who has a position of authority mm. talking about, you know, the oppression, talking about yeah. calculus, talking about, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. And suddenly it's very powerful. I know I feel it when I go talk to a, 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 a new member or someone and, and they are black and I go, this is what's going on. I've been, you know, and it just feels good. It feels mm -hmm. relaxed for me to be able to do that, accept it. And so that gives me staying power. It's an hour and a half to get up there. It's, it's early in the morning. I don't generally like it, right? It's the winter. <laughs> I'm just like, why am I doing this, right? I don't care about the title. I don't care, you know? right. right, right, this means nothing to me. But when I sit there and I see students coming in of color and they're sitting, oh, oh Jay. I, we, we're winning because they're relaxed, exactly. right? Yeah. And, they, and they can talk about anything. Yeah. They can talk about home, they can talk about the, their experience, right? Yeah. And I'm not curing it for them. I'm like, I hear you, I know, right? And, that, and so they're not alone, right? That's the piece. You're, you're not alone in this. And when I first came here, I was alone. It felt that way. Right? Can I ask a question? Because I am not from Maine on this panel. Um, <laughs> I, my first black um, teacher was in elementary school. Mm. So, uh, yeah, yes. I, yeah, I'm just I, curious. This is groundbreaking here that you are definitely. like a person of authority. Whereas being all around the country, like people have better, like more diverse examples of somebody who can be a teacher and somebody who can be a psychologist. Mm. And I think it's, it's interesting to know from you mm. that you're getting that experience. And you both were raised here. So when was, when was the first time you had a black person as your teacher? Mm -hmm. College. Mm. College. In New York. In New York. Right, right, yeah, yeah, it was really in college for yeah. sure, I think. But, you know, I mean, there were some, but they were all coaches, you know. It was all recreation or music or right. art, mm -hmm. you know. So yeah. those, were my, those were where the educators came mm. in for me. But I think also my mother went out of her way to make sure. Right. So, <laughs> you know, so she's like, all right, we got to get you something around here. <laughs> yeah. And then, let me, let me look around, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, there, was, there was nothing. I mean, in leadership positions, I saw very few black people. And so now when there's a black person in any type of like healing or leadership position, it's very groundbreaking. It's mm. the first of like, I've been the first blank of anything. Like I was right. definitely like, the, I was the only black person in my school until, I don't know, probably sixth grade, I think. Oh, yeah. And then I was the first black person that my place of employment has ever hired. So like everything is like groundbreaking. Yeah. I'm like paving these paths. I, and like, we shouldn't have to, but that's how it is. It's yeah. just the way, especially here that it is. Mm. It's like the first black blank mm. because we just don't have those levels of representation. Mm. And because of that, I feel I take this work I do that much more seriously mm. because I'm like, there needs to be like a million more coming after me. And right. if there's no one paving that, then who's going to do it? Mm. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty crazy. Especially but here, I think. Especially here. Because yeah. it, there's some peace that has been hidden. So I think yeah. that there's something missing there that, yeah. you know, that's still a much greater conversation yeah. of why mm -hmm. um, the leaders, because I, I feel they are here, but, you know, the acknowledgement, again, so the support, because you're holding a weight yes. that isn't acknowledged. Yeah. Even when yeah. you're the only black kid at a school, you're educating all the time. Right. And I didn't realize that until I was older, and then I got the chance to reflect, and I was like, y'all should have paid me because um, <laughs> I'm just saying now, now what you invite me to do and what I do now, yeah. and I still continue to do for free. This is a problem. <laughs> this is a problem. Yeah. I was like, you know, and then I have to say it and then I feel, but I like, you know, like feeling bad about it, but I don't want to feel bad about these mm. things. It just should be the standard yeah. instead of having to justify or, yeah. you know, yeah. certify or whatever myself to be payable. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Or so you're Venmo, right? Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, like, <laughs> it's funny just to see, like, in, spa in spaces though, and like when you're saying people are coming in and seeing you sitting there, people of color and black people, it's like, oh my god, like, okay, right. let me sit down. And it's, yeah, it's just that level of seeing somebody else in a space that you normally would not, right? That 
is black. Like I was in Belfast on the water and I saw like there was like one other black person. Right. I was on a boat and we were like, <laughs> like we were like, wait, wait. <laughs> right. And we had like, a, oh my god, hey, hey, hey. And it's like that. It's just like that excitement of being like, you're here, I'm here. This is great because this is kind of a predominantly white area and just not a place that we, you know, are often. And yeah, so I, yeah. I totally understand that feeling of like. <sighs> when people mm. see <laughs> right right <laughs> and again in it in, unto itself that is the art right yeah and i'm going to go on a limb i think that um people of color have had to work so hard that they are progressive and i'm not saying everybody but you yeah. you know because you're doing it already right yeah. and suddenly there's an awakening you're like oh you see it now? What's <laughs> yeah. right? I mean, there it is, forever. <laughs> right? And, and, so, and suddenly, yeah. and so for us, it's like, you know, stage seven, right? Or something, you know, of, mm -hmm. of this progressiveness. And so when I think about it, I think that, you know, I'm already like, you know, eight, nine, ten steps ahead. We're talking about yes. that equity. We know what that means. But, but yet we are in a situation where... People still have to learn what that actually means, and that's frustrating. Yeah. And, well, it's it's we're creating new lexicons here. So instead mm. of letting people know what it means, we're showing them what it is. Mm. And this is important. We're mo like you know, um, English is business as usual. You know, it's not a language of love for mm. sure. <laughs> but um, you know, so we could start to. I think that's what we're seeing shift here. Yeah. Um, that you know, right now we're just we're using this transactional mm. language. Mm. So in America, it's going to be a little hard to get past that. <laughs> um, so, but that's why I think that visuals and video and art is coming into mm. this space where you know i mean i'm getting into the nfts you'll probably hear this from me first <laughs> <laughs> i mean i don't know if y'all know what those are <laughs> anyway okay we're gonna we're gonna get into it <laughs> um but you know you're you're going to see these mm. you know yeah new ways of communicating mm. with each other and if you are knowledgeable and if you you know are mm. paying attention you'll you'll, you'll speak the up. language yeah. you're going to pick it up or you're going to create the language right. or you're going to create the code for the language and we're going to yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. like natasha said then they come to you exactly you mentioned that with visuals instead of words and exactly then come that's to why so yes definitely from what you said earlier those, yeah those are cool, yeah. which is cool yeah i love that so i i you know first i just want to add what a great conversation this has been and and this is what we're talking about, right? We, we have such a diverse group right here. And it's like, you know, the smallest group you can have, but it's so diverse. But yet, how we can have a conversation, recognize the, the beauty of communicating art as a way of resolving conflict, right? As a way of generating thought, mm -hmm. right? Um, the, even myself, and do it for years, but I'm amazed that just thinking about the 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 what are barriers and what how do we define those and are we doing it are we creating barriers right so i talking about age right and i'm i'm creating a, this barrier for myself so it comes out in my language and so it comes out in what i do but yet it's really about people right mm -hmm. and we and us moving forward can, can i tell you about another example that, that really is dear to my heart. For about eight years, I worked with kids in uh, Lewiston in the middle school, and a lot of those kids are from families from away, from the New Mainers. And we had them in the Spanish class, we had them make these beautiful shrines to, about somebody that they had lost, mm. someone mm. who had passed, or about a country they had left behind, mm. a place. And so their assignment was to ask questions of, of all their relatives, their friends, find out what their history was, and to make something that was actually beautiful. And we supplied, you know, just tons and tons of materials, and the kids came every day and worked on it and worked on it. Um, and in the end, wrote lots of love letters to the other teacher and to myself. Thank you for getting me to ask, to, Thank you for getting me to know my history. 
thank you for getting me to talk to my dad. I never talked to him. And, and he answered all these questions that I had. Thank you for helping me know my family better mm -hmm. and, and knowing my history. Um, and, and the kids each shared their stories. It was so visual, you know, and so exciting to look into each shrine that all the kids learned way more about each other mm -hmm. and cared about each other's stories. And, and a, an artist's role is to help people tell stories, mm -hmm. tell their stories, and to listen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, brilliant discussion that we've had just this, just this hour, and, I'm, and it's a shame that we have to wrap this up. But I want to just thank each and every one of you for participating and, and practicing what we're talking about. All right? And if there's one thing that I want to leave you all with, um, recognizing that imagery, art, is always kind of telling you a story. And if you're open enough, you can see what that story is. So, thank you, all of you. Pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Yeah, Chi-Chi. <laughs> we love me. We love you, Chi-Chi. Yeah. <laughs>